Hello. Um, I think we're going to, to, to start. Um, welcome to this digital talk. Um, we met the Digital Leadership Institute last October. At that time, they were launching Digital Bruxelles, Europe's, Europe's first female tech incubator. What became very clear during the event and during the different very interesting keynotes, as I might say, <laughs> was that the absence of women in tech is a phenomenon that we underestimate. The underrepresentation of girls and women in tech education, in tech entrepreneurship, and in tech leadership is striking, certainly when you're presented with the numbers. Digital Brussels has the mission of supporting teen and adult women on their way to become digital entrepreneurs and leaders. But the challenge in Europe is no different than the one we're facing in developing countries. How can we make sure to include girls and women when we're talking about digital for development? And what is the opportunity for development agencies in this discussion? And what role might Belgium play in leading the way? I present you Gerald Miller van Dijk from the Digital Leadership Institute. Thank you. <laughs> well, wow, okay, that's good. What a lovely introduction. Um, and I'd like to thank you and your team and Thea and her team and Eric for inviting me here um, and introduce you to my colleague Loredana, who's also joining us today. And thank you for coming out on a day where the wind is bad, apparently. <laughs> the wind inside and outside, because I think there's also a, a flu going around. So I'm afraid I'm not quite as sparkly as usual, but I'm going to do my best to get you through some of these questions that Heisbert um, shared with you. I also want to say that I'm, I'm American by birth, so guilty as uh, charged. But I've lived in Belgium now for 20 years, um, almost 20 years, in Brussels, Exprès Nederlands, je parle français aussi. And en fait, je me sens plutôt une Marolienne, um, because I don't speak Dutch or French extremely well, but I can mix them both and communicate <laughs> really well. And I've lived probably 10 years of my life right in this neighborhood, so I'm really glad to be here for all those reasons. Um, and I, as education, I actually have um, a degree in a bachelor in international relations law and organizations from Georgetown University. So I actually studied um, international law and uh, development and then somehow took a turn and ended up in the tech sector and am now back here. So I, th I feel like um, this is a step towards coming home, coming closer to something that I'm very passionate about and I care about a lot. So I'm going to talk today, um, I'm afraid because I haven't been so well, I haven't been able to do as much of the background research on women and tech in development per se, um, but I think I have enough to give you a nice lay of the land and then to speak more specifically about the activities that we're carrying out as DLI and how some of these that are all formulated for us to be able to replicate and scale them um, are definitely vehicles that we can optimize and utilize to promote um, greater uptake of women in tech for development. And that's really my slogan for the day and actually for my life. This is something I truly believe in. I think for achieving the sustainable development goals not only in the developing world, but also, as you'll see, in Europe, North America, and the rest of the, you know, the geographic north, um, that more women in tech, more women in these strategic innovative sectors as leaders, as entrepreneurs, is really critical for the development ambitions or, or the sustainable development ambitions we have for all of society. So. Um, going to have to <laughs> find a, be a more efficient way to circle in on this. Oops, <laughs> pushed the wrong button. <laughs> oh, okay, that's not my, oh, okay. First of all, my details. So I, I should probably put this at the end of the slide um, or y use that when I'm telling you about uh, who I am and what I do. Um, I want to start with this slide. Uh, some of it will be repetition from our launch event, but I think it's always very useful I'm sorry, to begin by saying um, we're extremely spoiled in Belgium. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe you know all this, right? Don't, how many of you are familiar with this, uh, with these numbers, you know? And, um, uh, okay, I hope at least, you know, these numbers. There are 7.3 billion people in the world. Um, you know that. That it seems like we're all online, but what I'd like to flag to you is that only 3%, one-third of the entire global population is actually um, online today. In Belgium, we are really spoiled. We're consistently in the top, really, top one or two countries in terms of the penetration of broadband. Not so good in terms of skills and the ecosystem needed to support digitization. So we have our own work to do in Belgium. But in the rest of the world, too, um, in the, in the uh, global south, um, actually, the majority of people are not online. And a very important thing to note is that of those who have access and are using the internet, there are, number one, more men. And number two, the rate at which people are coming online is inherently discriminatory. discriminatory. So the rate that men are coming online is faster than the rate at which women are coming online. And we talk about then all things being equal, um, the digital divide, but I talk about a gendered digital divide. And I want, I've kind of mixed two presentations here, so you have to bear with me a bit while I navigate it. Um, to get our arms around what this challenge represents, in fact, um, in Europe, only about one third of all STEM students are female. One in four computer science degrees are held by women. In Belgium, the numbers are unfortunately the worst in Europe and actually the worst in the developing world. So I don't know if that's news to any of you. Do you know that? Did you know that? Belgium has the worst participation of girls and women in STEM in the developing world. These are o OECD statistics from last year. The headline was buried, unfortunately. Um, so let's ask ourselves why, but maybe not go into it right at the moment. So for Belgium, the statistics are even worse. These are for, for Europe as a rule. One in five girls wants to work in tech. One in five ICT jobs is held by a woman. And these are not usually tech or management roles. They're more administrative or other you know, um, client-facing roles. Um, but in the larger scheme of things, so once you exit uh, East, uh, uh, Europe and, and North America, these are, this is the drill down on some of the statistics I just mentioned. 1.3 billion out of 2.8 billion internet users are women. Um, in terms of, we talk about mobile in the developing world, you know, and there are some very interesting uh, case studies around mobile for development. Are you familiar with them? Um, in particular, for women, um, having a phone to monitor health and, for example, pregnancies when the midwife has to come by, these kinds of things. So there's a, uh, as you know, there's um, a penetration of mobile in Africa, for example, that is larger than in Europe. So more people have a phone. Are they male? Are they female? That's another question. Um, but there are some examples of very interesting use of this technology for development purposes. Unfortunately, today, it's anecdotal. So this is kind of the emphasis that I want to make is there is an opportunity around creating some more synergies across the initiatives that are out there um, and, and explicitly promoting technology at, with and for women as a um, developing, um, as a development tool. I think the rest is clear, all right. And those who don't have the access to the, t so we talk about access, we talk about um, 
uh, skills, digital skills, and then we talk about like leadership and digital. In the developing world, you're lacking all three of these effectively, and the, the populations that are not engaged, digitally engaged, end up having these kinds of uh, profiles. So disenfran disenfranchised, unskilled, uneducated, and exploited. Um, is there a causality? I don't know. Is there a correlation? Very much so. So it's the same populations that are not connected, that are also um, suffering the exploits of war and famine and so forth. I'm only saying this because I want you to understand, especially the women in the room, what our job is here. And then speak a bit about what the opportunity is of bootstrapping women across the board, so not only in the, the developing world, but in the developed world as well. And this is the so-called girl effect that I mentioned. You know, I don't, I don't know if any of you saw that video that came out in, the, in 2010 about, um, but I think now it's become pretty much the conventional wisdom. If you give a girl a dollar, she'll spend it on her family, she'll spend it on her school, she'll spend it on her community. And that has actually been the evolution in development thinking was used to be very much top down and throw a lot of money at the problem. And we realized through failure basically that it's very important to actively engage women in communities to see the change that you want um, to accomplish. And the reality is, is that um, that engaging women not only in the developing world, but just broadly speaking, has an economic benefit. I'm not going to read these, but you can. I say it's a moral benefit. These slides are old, but okay. Um, back in 2011, Harvard was saying, companies with more women at the top engage in more philanthropy. And then a whole bunch of, you know, are women more empathetic? Are they not? I don't know, but you know, the, some of the research is out there. But I like this. So, with equal access to education, women raise the living standards for their families and inject life into the local economy. They guarantee food security, um, etc. So you've seen a shift in the, in the development thinking, right, that has very much a focus on engaging girls and women. And now, and this unfortunately is the stuff that I couldn't pull out for you, but I just know offhand that now the realization in um, development funding is that we have to engage women with technology. Um, I mean, for me, that's a no-brainer. Um, but I know, for example, that uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is doing this research on gendered data um, and other projects that are actually trying to connect the women and technology for development question. But let's start with Europe, okay? Because um, it's already really bad here as well. So some of the things he has been mentioned, I'm going to give you some of those numbers. I think you'll be surprised again. Um, and start with just this quote from Nelly Cruz, who I love, and, um, you know, uh, again, all us being equal, I think, is a role model. She said, ICTs are a girl's best friend. And her... Um, colleague at the time, I don't have the more recent quote, also said this. Her counterpart in the ITU said this. So now I want to talk just briefly about what the challenges in Europe, then a bit about what we're doing, and see how we can bring the story that we have here to the development context. So unfortunately, it's more bad news. 
of all of the, so I said we talk about access, we talk about skills, and we talk about digital leadership. In Europe as well, a woman is less likely to have access to the internet. She's more likely to have low or no digital skills. And as a result, she's more likely to be excluded from this digital transformation that is afoot. Now, I don't want to say that this challenge is more uh, acute in the developing world, because again, in some scenarios, you have um, a leapfrogging situation where actually there's more activity, more engagement, more development in cities in Africa than even in Europe, for example. It really depends. Uh, I don't want to say that uh, you know, across the board that this is the situation. Um, but I think as a whole, so comparing Europe with other regions of the world, we are definitely um, privileged here. Nonetheless, I mean, for example, in terms of all of the countries that are digitized, uh, Europe has something called, and some of these, stati these statistics I'll show you come from these um, country reports, called the Digital Economy and Society Index. Um, European countries top the charts consistently in terms of how digitized our societies are. That notwithstanding, this is still the situation here. So there is a gendered digital uh, divide in Europe as well. Let's look at the numbers. Out of all Europeans, 51% are digitally unskilled. That is, they have no or low digital skills. And the gender breakdown for that is what you see here. In absolute numbers, though, that represents 12 million more European women than men who are digitally unskilled. These are, and the, the news is not getting better. There's more reports coming out. PwC just released a report about education. Girls are not, despite their access to technology, use of smartphones, coding, code week, European girls are still not choosing to study computer science and STEM areas. Brand new study on this. Can, can I just ask you a question sure. to understand in the sure. previous slide? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it correct that in 2015 there were more digitally unskilled Europeans? If I look at the table on the left, 2012? Actually, you know, um, this comes down to measurement and the size, the growing size of the European Union. Okay. So you have more countries in scope. Um, so I actually just took the, but I crunched all these numbers myself. So, you know, with all uh, due respect, I have to disclaim, you know, whether, whether it's completely accurate or not. Um, but I, I think there's, you know, like uh, my father always said, there are um, liars, there are big liars, and there are statist statisticians. Um, the <laughs> you have to be careful, and I'm sure you know this in your own jobs, about what the statistics appear to say. I get um, reports from Eurostat, you know, that's our European collection of data, including what comes out of Belgium, um, and what they're comparing, for example, to, to illustrate a closing of for example, the unemployment gap between males and young women and young men. Um, they talk about, you know, if, if female unemployment is 18% and male unemployment is 12%, they only talk about the difference between these two percentages. And if this number goes up, then they say the gap is closed which seems like good news, but no, it's not, right? There's actually more unemployment. And there is very rarely actually statistics around absolute numbers. So this for me is what's compelling. We know there are more women in Europe than there are men. So when you say over half of the female population is not digitally skilled, 
versus half of the male population, uh, in absolute terms, we need to look at that because that's a pretty important message to be focusing on women because it actually adds up to that many more millions of people who are not digitally skilled. So for me, you know, those red flags kind of go off and I then start scrabbling around in the data to try to get a, a real picture of what's going on. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But so take it on face, well, maybe don't take it on face value, but I think it's very illustrative and that's, I think, enough, you know. Because it's not only that individual piece of data, it's the whole trend. So, um, but thank you for the question, because I'm, I'm happy to, to, to try to, I guess, um, do what I can to make it clear, concrete, what the problem is. These st statistics, same thing. So um, access, skills. Um, then I like to see, when I talk about digital leadership, you know, our institute, the Digital Leadership Institute, this statistic, when I saw the numbers, when I dug around, floored me. And I've been sharing it in every uh, channel I possibly can since I discovered this in the fall of last year. Um, that since 2005, there's effectively not one more female tech expert in Europe in the workplace. Let me let that sink in. Not one more female tech expert in Europe since 2005. And these statistics are from, so the, you know, the, the, census numbers are from 2005 to 2015 and actually a drill down into the numbers in 2016 and 2017 tells an even more depressing story that the numbers are dropping absolute numbers so what i what i saw in the data was um that you had a relative drop there 20 women used to um, have 22 percent of this market as uh, it specialists and that number dropped to 16 percent but then when I crunched the numbers what you see is in this you know in a market where the demand for tech expertise that's probably my phone isn't it the demand for tech expertise is growing almost exponentially you know it's literally like three percent year on year you know what the demand for IT expertise in Europe is it's like skyrocketing so the demand is like this the jobs being filled are like this. It's, it's just blowing away the rest of the workforce, basically, these tech jobs. Um, but the participation of women is flatlining. So you can look there, you can look at skills, you can look at enrollments in formal computer science education and it's a very bad story across the board. It's also a very bad, I mean, it's not only uh, women, but boys are also not studying STEM. So like in the US, we're now talking about STEAM. Let's make it interesting for kids and talk about art as well, right? STEM plus art. And as DLI, we talk about, we put the E for entrepreneurship on, fr on the front. And we talk about, about esteem, esteem skills for girls and women. We get accused of discriminating, especially in Belgium. The Belgian school system is really a very good one, but if you want to change it, if you want to make any improvements there, then forget it. Um, <laughs> no, it's a fact. Why would you, why, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, but the things that we want to fix are things that aren't even on the radar in terms of how education is, is um, uh, carried out in Belgium. So gender balance, um, all those other kinds of diversity questions are not even being discussed, let alone is there proactive measures to make sure that in those top Flemish schools that are the top in the world in math and science, that we at least have some girls and some people of color. So what is it that you're measuring? What is it that your conscious objective? 
um, that's the outcome that you're going to have. So esteem, we're trying to do esteem. Um, and then there's, so there's one other element that I want to just toss in here, and this applies in the developing world as well as the developed world, is the demand for those jobs, the de demands for IT expertise. Um, Naley Cruz and all these other, you know, Eurocrats talk about more or less one million jobs that will go unfilled in Europe in 2020 if we don't get more people into tech. So I always say, isn't that, doesn't that make it obvious that we should be targeting women then? Because they are the ones who are not participating. Um, but that, uh, unfortunately, that message falls on deaf ears. Except, I'm very proud to say, in Belgium, uh, at least last year, we were uh, approved for funding from the Digital Belgium Skills Fund. So at least there's, we're starting to get some, some traction around the question. We don't know if we'll get funding for this year, but, but we're trying. Um, so a million jobs that will go unfilled if we just pursue business as usual. However, now that every industry actually is digital, right? Not just the IT, ICT sector. Leisure, entertainment, education, travel, medicine, basically every facet that touches our lives in a given day has become digitized as well. And this is the disruption, right? This is where things are, are, are growing at an exponential, kind of frightening even, like, you know, whoa, we have to rein it in a bit, have some diverse leadership that's saying, is this really what we want to have happen here? Um, with the disruption component, the number of jobs that will go unfilled in Europe is more like a million and a half, or maybe more, you know? We, don't, we can't even really calculate it. So I've covered all this. If you want my slides, I'd be happy to share, share them with you. There are a couple key things, like if there were as many women as, and men in the tech sector, we could d drive um, GDP, like the GDP of Denmark could be added to the Euro European economy every year. So there's this economic uh, element as well. Not to mention, for me, it's about the economic self-determination. You guys like that word in, in development, right? It's not only the determination of nations, but also of individuals. Um, we're giving women economic opportunity, I think, by giving them digital skills for themselves. And then one, okay, one other key, like, I know this is quite heavy, but I, I, I can't drive the point home enough, I think. So we talk about skills, we talk about um, access, IT expertise. But now look, let's look at, look at the startup um, ecosystem where tech and startup are basically synonymous, right? Or startup is synonymous with digital driven entrepreneurship, sometimes just <laughs> digitally enabled entrepreneurship where in both cases, you don't have participation of women. We sometimes get uh, caught up just not being able to build and put a website online, and that's the end of our, our startup ambitions. And I look at this number specifically because it's like I, I said yesterday at a meeting with the European Commission. For me, this number of female tech starters is the canary in the coal mine. What is it like in the developing world? I think that's a very interesting question that hopefully we can pursue. But unofficially in Belgium, we don't, we don't have official numbers because you measure what you treasure. So if, you, if no one gives a darn, then there aren't even any statistics about it, good or bad. Um, but unofficially, 3% of all tech starters in Belgium are female. 3%. 3% 3 
think of all the money that is spent in the tech ecosystem, in the startup ecosystem. Think of all the money spent in tech on building our broadband economy here. Transpose that to developing world, you know, where other investments of similar, of similar kind are, are happening. But imagine uh, close, uh, back at home now. What is happening there? How is that money being spent? Why are there no women engaged here? Some of the answers are, oh, women don't like this. It's not for them. They're not interested. They're not good at it. But I can tell you, as one of the initiatives that DLI runs, we organize these pan-European awards recognizing the top girls and women in tech. And we also have an award for best practices. So if we see organizations that are doing nifty, innovative things, we, bring, we want to bring recognition to them. And the first ever winner of, our, of that award um, is based in Berlin. They have an all-women's bachelor in IT program that is three times oversubscribed for the number of slots available. So it's not a question of not wanting. It's a question of what, in what way we can engage women into the tech ecosystem as IT specialists, as leaders, as entrepreneurs. So 3% in Belgium. Across Europe, it's 10%, uh, but I think that's even exaggerated. Um, and one of the other things I want to uh, underscore is, so not only the focus on female, but also the focus on women with experience. Because when we look at you know, the initiatives that are taking place in the, in the startup ecosystems, loans from the banks is always, it's the 35 and unders, right? Europe's top innovators, 35 and under. Um, uh, what's the word? Um, special loan conditions from the bank for 35 and unders. But the reality is, for the past 10 years, McKinsey has been telling us that 80% of women are marginalized by traditional career paths. 10 years, 80%. I wonder what the number is for men, too. Be interesting. Which is, in other words, it's the glass ceiling phenomenon, right? You get to a certain point, mid-30s, and women parachute out of the patriarchy. Um, so do men, but socially, it's more acceptable for women to do this. It happens in Belgium, too. The, the same numbers, same phenomenon. Because we don't see... We're, the number one reason for the women to leave their jobs is, do you know what it is? Throw some ideas out there. Well, the most obvious would be kids, but I would say maybe the husband that has to go out and say, no. You know, Flemish men are the best uh, dads in Europe, just for the record. So <laughs> they are. That's research base. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so you could say, no, that's not the... The number one reason women leave is for is not feeling appreciated. I forget what the reason for men is. <laughs> I just felt like, oh, okay, yeah, I can. So, glass ceiling. There are millions of women out there who leave their their uh, nine to five jobs. There are a lot in Belgium as well. We become independent. We become consultants. But 85% of us are working alone. So 85% of women in Europe who leave and start their own enterprises are flying solo. 85% of single proprietorship enterprises in Europe are women-led. So what does that tell us? I, like for me, it says opportunity. 
Where are these women? What are they doing? What do they know? How motivated are they? Um, what are their digital skills like? And I really think if we can tap into that population, and this isn't only in Europe, but anywhere, basically. Um, well, here's some discrimination that happens in the startup ecosystem, just for the record. If we could tap into that population, what could happen? If we can carry out initiatives that are cross-generational, that are bringing young women in and mature women in to do things that make a difference towards, the, towards sustainable development, for example. So this kind of thinking is really what influences basically everything that we do as DLI. Our mission is inclusive digital transformation. It used to be bridging the gender gap and the digital divide worldwide. But I would get these kind of glazed looks when I say that. So I, you know, know your, know your audience. <laughs> we had to kind of, still, it works. We're not going to go into why these phenomena are there, okay? Maybe in the Q&A. But let's talk, and then very briefly now, because I want to field those questions. What is it that we do to address all those challenges? There are a lot, right? We talk about the leaky pipeline. You know, in a given female's lifetime, there are all kinds of opportunities for her to jump out of, or fall out of, leak out of the STEM sector. And our work literally started with just trying to patch up one little hole targeting young girls, just to keep the doors open to STEM as a, a study path, as a career path. But once we got busy with that, we saw, well, okay, if we keep her in here, but then she, she jumps out there that's not going to help either. Or you know, if we don't see her come back and work in the sector or become a researcher or we're still not achieving all those objectives that we have. So this is my up update on Naley Cruz's uh, <laughs> a free and open internet. Is good. So in case you don't know, you should still be lob lobbying for net neutrality. Um, Darn, I didn't mean to. Uh, all these slides, there are just a couple things that I want to highlight, OK? The opportunity of the cloud and mobile for development, but also for bootstrapping those demographics that are not on board in the digital disruption today. Actually, cloud and mobile are part of the d digital disruption. Without these tools, uh, the disruption would not be happening. Think of your favorite online services. Let me see if they're in here. No, they're not. Your fa who, who uses Netflix? Who uses Airbnb? Who uses Dropbox? These are all cloud-based tools that our partners, by the way, just like our, after the Digital Belgium Skills Fund, Amazon Web Services has been very supportive of the work of DLI. I think we're literally among a handful of organizations around the world that Jeff Bezos has said they will get support from us, all the way down to operationally people who are coming and running trainings and doing things with us for our, uh, our target um, public. So we're extremely grateful for that. But all those companies are running on Amazon Web Services. AWS today effectively is the cloud. There are other cloud um, suppliers doing different stuff. Very interesting. What IBM is doing, what, um, what Google is doing. And that's only going to grow, you know? And it effectively means that you, as a 
person can build a Netflix yourself from one day to the next. Literally. So these two things, plus the focus on that, for me, are where we're, we're heading for the future, and nothing short of that with girls and women, okay? especially in those sectors, because that's where the need is the greatest, and where I hope we can like, short-circuit some of the challenges. Hmm. Maybe just a couple things on, so we, we have four what we call value offerings. And some of the things that r repeat throughout those value offerings are what we've learned from our from practices, from what I consider best practice. If you want to reach girls and women to get them into tech, you have to run initiatives that are girl and women focused. I don't know why. Well, I have my theories. But anything that's mixed does not work. They do not come. They do not come. So dig into your own psyche and answer why that's the case. It's about confidence though, right? So female focused, hands-on, result-oriented, um, values-oriented. So if we go back to what I said earlier about engaging women for development, the moment you make a connection with the SDGs and using technology, girls and women get engaged. And we, re we use this thinking in everything that we do. We focus on four areas. The first are the ADA awards that I mentioned. The second is something called the INCUBE, which is specifically targeting female tech entrepreneurship. This is also why we launched the incubator. And this platform we call INCUBE with a Q. We have a, a flagship event called Move It Forward that we've now run 10 times. In fact, we are running one in Brussels next week and you're all warmly invited to come by, to sign up, to participate. This time we're actually running it during the week. Usually we do it on a weekend. If you're interested, let me know afterwards. But basically, these are kind of startup hackathon events, but we don't call it that. We say it's move it forward, female digital starters. The emphasis on starter, so they know it's for beginners, not on startup. Half of the time is actually trainings, because you often get that women go, oh, I can't do this, I'm not a developer. And we say, well, we'll teach you how to build a website. We'll teach you how to launch it in the cloud. We'll teach you how to do a quick and dirty smartphone application. And then we'll teach you something about the technology around the, uh, the challenge that we're asking you to tackle. And we ask them to tackle a challenge. So to date, we have run Move It Forward events with and for women refugees with and for women Roma, um, on cyber violence, on cyber security. Next week is on women's health and big data. And the topics are always about, um, about challenges that are disproportionately impacting girls and women. So we give them the challenge, and we give them the tools, and we give them the environment themselves to come up with the solution to those challenges because some of them, let's face it, will not be addressed unless women are addressing it ourselves. What have we found? Extremely interesting. The first ever such Move It Forward event that we ran with the support of the uh, Brussels region on cyber violence addressed violence, domestic violence more broadly. 40 participants ages 15 to 60 26 nationalities. We've now been doing these events for two years, and next year, well, this year, we've been asked to go to Shanghai, uh, 
Saigon, um, and places in Europe too. So, <laughs> um, so we want to do replicate it in other places in Belgium, but also replicate it and scale it to other countries. And the next step for us is a platform, an online community that's connecting all the women who are doing these, uh, participating in the events. Because we get them in, we usually have eight projects that are run during the course of the weekend, and then four or five that are viable after that. Yes, a lot of them are socially oriented, and that's fine. Um, but our challenge has actually been what do we do with them once we've gotten them excited about startup? Once we've taught them how to build a website and so forth. And this is actually why we launched the incubator. Because the hard thing is pushing women over the edge to start in either tech-driven especially or tech-enabled startup. But once we've excited them to do that, we don't have a space we don't have a training program. We don't have funds. And this is a really key thing, is to attract investment for those initiatives. Mm -hmm. And that's where our next set of challenges is, in fact. So that's why the incubator is there. It's more of, of a concept and a rallying point. It's also a physical space, so cool. Um, I'll skip through that. You're very welcome to, to ask about it. This is the initiative targeting little girls. It's called Digital Muse. We run something called the Girl Tech Fest that's like two or three hundred girls in one day, all volunteer run, lots of moving parts, big impact, and they keep STEM on their radar in terms of study decisions. By the way, did you know that in countries where you have to choose your study direction sooner, that less girls choose STEM? That's something for us to take on board for Belgium as well. So the longer girls can wait to decide what they're going to do, the more likely they are to pick science and technology. So the fourth area, I mentioned the Ada Awards, InCube, Digital Muse, and the thing that we just launched this past year with the support of Digital Belgium Skills Fund is something called CyPro, Cyber Professional training and job placement for women with work experience. It is a, an apprenticeship program using professional certifications like Cisco, Amazon Web Services, to short circuit the path into tech specialism by women. We're specifically targeting women with work experience, but not excluding anyone else. And in our first year, we had 80 people in our, in our uh, inaugural cohort, which again answers the question, maybe women don't like tech. No. I have an expletive that I would use for that, but we're being recorded. So um, when they have the opportunity and the circumstances achieves what it, what they, it needs to, to, to draw them in. Participation of women is not the difficult part. Our next challenge now with this cohort is to place them into companies in Belgium in cybersecurity roles or in cloud roles or IoT roles. Um, but they're women who already have transversal skills, project management experience, general management experience, sometimes content uh, deep experience. So that's our next objective. Any help you can give um, is welcome. Leaning on some members of the, even in the Belgian government, I think could be very, very interesting. The profiles of the women are really across the board. All kinds of um, socioeconomic, educational, and cultural backgrounds. And this is an opportunity we have here to be able to then replicate into other cities and other countries and even, like I say, to the global south, which is our objective with, what, uh, with everything that we're doing. And in fact, we're already on the path to be doing that in the coming years, I hope so. 
I think that's everything. There's more details on all of the initiatives in this presentation, which I'm happy to share with you. Um, I don't know how much time we have left, but I'm open for, oh, no time. We have no time left. So I guess it's up to you if you want to stay and ask questions or, Jespert, what would you? I guess we stop the delay, so maybe five, ten minutes. Ten minutes of, yeah. <coughs> I certainly dumped a lot of information on you, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, uh, I was aware of the fact that uh, like a mobile phone is much more, a smartphone is much more used than computers, for example. So that yes. is their access to internet and to tech. Mm -hmm. But then um, I was in Congo last year and I found out that it's actually very expensive. Uh, it's, well, I mean, it's only in Congo, I don't know about mm -hmm. other countries, but it's actually very expensive to use a mobile phone it, there. Mm -hmm. So, which means that there is then very in economic opportunity for mm -hmm. them to really, I mean, of course, they use smartphones, but to really then mm -hmm. have that as their single tool to uh, intensify use of tech. There's not man many things left mm -hmm. for them. So you do have the challenge of broadband deployment more uh, more large scale. I mean, here we don't have that problem because of the investments in the infrastructure. So that's a channel uh, for development, but then you have all the other social, political, economic implications of, of that infrastructure development. What I do know is, um, for example, that now AWS has a, a, a region in Africa, so it might be more ex expensive to access the cloud, but the cloud is there. And what does that mean? You can be doing mass, mass scale computing um, that you, where you don't have to be online to actually be doing the computing, um, where you can host a website that, for example, is only where you're only charged for actual traffic driven to your website. So you put it there, you put it in the cloud. If millions of people use it, great. If they don't, then you don't pay anymore. Yeah. So it's the kind of, uh, it's like your mobile a subscription for using the internet or at least for being able to have an, a business in the internet or any internet presence so it's still very interesting I think even given those phenomenon and um, you know that's just simply a, a market uh, maturity question I mean also in Belgium we suffer from some of the some of the highest mobile rates in Europe you know, that's a question we have to take up with our leadership. But um, yeah, and in the developing world, that's going to be that much more difficult, I think, mm -hmm. depending. It's also about the uh, economic vision of the leadership of those countries. I mean, some pockets, you definitely have a much more vibrant uh, ecosystem that is uh, tech-focused um, and tech-driven. But I'm also not familiar with the the granularity across the whole African landscape or even globally, you know, South America, Asia. I think it really depends on the country. Yes? Yeah, I have an additional uh, question about the Berlin program. You were talking about a uh, program specific for women, a uh, school? The Berlin program, yes. The Berlin program. So they actually run a bachelor program bachelor. called for uh, a bachelor for women in IT. Yeah, and what's different of uh, the, the standard? Nothing. So There's the only nothing. thing that's different is it's for women. And that's all it has to do. I've asked the, the director of the program too, like, what do you see in terms of, so she, she gave me two really interesting stories. One. A mom who was looking for a program for her daughter who also joined them. So again, you have this like multi-generational aspect. Um, and also that after two years, it, it's confidence building. It's about confidence. 
after two years, the women in the program, I mean, it was part of, you can just imagine, like, at, if uh, the ULB had such a program, it's not standalone. It's actually part of a larger computer science faculty. So they're also in an environment where there are guys, um, and, they, and they do project work together. She told me that after two years, the women felt like confident enough with the skill set that they had developed to engage as equals in the rest of the activities of the faculty. So I think that's a really, um, I, I guess, revealing point is, for me too, everything that we do, we see the transformation that's purely around confidence, like unpacking what is, what is this? Android coding, you know, what is this? So everything that we do is about delivering that uh, on a platter. Here is Android coding. Let's open that up, figure out what it is, make some stuff with it, talk about what it is that we're doing, understand what the code is, and use a tool, ideally, like we, we promote something called MIT App Inventor, which is a, a, real, a blocks-oriented um, programming platform, let's say, um, with real Android coding in it, that is basically just puzzling together a program. The, the blocks have, they're color-coded, they're, you don't necessarily need to know exactly what that code is, but you can see from what works together or what doesn't, computational thinking. They use it now the, for first-year computer science students at MIT as well, just to get you kind of in the environment of coding and starting to see what the logic is, of it is, how the computers work. But the fact is you actually deliver real Android apps for, for smartphones, and they are now releasing the iOS version, which means very soon we can be teaching girls and women to use, these, um, use this platform to make, um, make uh, iPhone applications, which we will be doing. The other really interesting thing about that is one of the winners of our um, European Digital Girl of the Year Award, who was a, a young Flemish girl from Mechelen, she has launched her own girls' hacker space since winning the award, and she is teaching this platform to her friends. So we're not only teaching it, but we're teaching girls and women to teach it. And I think that's one of the key things, is an environment where the, the participants can get in, get their hands dirty, diffuse the mystery around it, play with it, make something. And inevitably, the responses are, oh, is that it? Yes, that's it. Well, that wasn't hard. Hmm. I think I'll use that again for this or that or that. And this is very much what we see, especially in these, these startup, the Move It Forward events, is there's a lot of positive motion that comes. You know, we diffuse all the jargon around startup. We go through the same steps. Um, and the output is real projects that deserve funding, they deserve follow-up, they deserve um, connection to mentors and experts and investors. Um, but yeah, <laughs> we need help. But if it's successful, why does it only uh, exist in Berlin? The HTW, the, you asked the magic question. Like we're doing everything we can to showcase these mm -hmm. kinds of things to say, Look, that should be replicated. I can tell you here, though, in Belgium, when I say, I approach a school and say, we want to do an event targeting girls because mm -hmm. look at these numbers. Mm -hmm. They say, that's discrimination. Mm -hmm. Bam, mm -hmm. door closed. So it is a kind of discrimination, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We, yes, I know them, yes. So mm -hmm. sometimes you also find this sort of initiative not really in the formal education system. Other fast social 
Very good point. Uh, it's in full day. I don't work for them, but mm -hmm. organize an event in October and they were Don't you? Great. Mm -hmm. So I think there are this sort of initiative, but that is true that in Belgium with the formal education system, you know, it's case by community, it's more complicated. So it's totally right when you say that it's harder to make the whole block moving because yes, you like you have all these reforms now and this was not part of it. So you can see there are some challenges to project in the future, but this initiative exists well in Belgium and I confident they definitely exist in other countries as well, mm -hmm. but maybe not directly in the formal education system, which really right. sort of different challenges and, you know, so Well, you, you highlight two interesting things. There is the opportunity for informal education, which is what we're doing. Um, and then I think also, like I say, in Belgium that we're burying the headline. And this is extremely destructive to me. It's not only, um, it's not benign, you know? We're talking about a digital disruption and there are no girls and women on board. These are your sisters, your moms, your daughters. Um, and we can't, even as informal education, we cannot make up for this risk. I mean, we're doing all we can. Also just about bringing awareness to the challenge. But I think you've got to have some better leadership around that, to be very honest. So I'm grateful that, uh, that um, Deputy Prime Minister De Croo is supporting our work. Um, I think we need more of that kind of visionary, or at least, I mean, think about the backlash that you get, though, by saying we need to promote girls and women in tech, um, why only girls? I hear that all the time, why only girls? The best example, I think, is, I think it's called Title IX in the US, where the federal government said, if you want to receive athletic uh, funding for athletics in your university, you must give as much money to female athletics as male athletics. And this has been in place now for 10 years, maybe longer, maybe 20. Yeah, definitely since I was in school. So yeah, decades that f uh, female sports gets as much funding as male sports. What is the outcome? In the Rio Olympics, the US women's team, if they had competed alone as a country would have taken third place overall. So these are very hard things to argue with, you know? What are we missing out on in terms of the potential of our highly educated women in Belgium that are not going in these? We have some very nice examples of extremely uh, amazing success stories of women in STEM in Belgium. But they are, it is not the norm by far. So what are we missing out on? What are our daughters and sisters and moms and cousins missing out on as individuals as well? That's kind of my driving uh, force. So I think it's true. There are these informal, mm, it's not enough. It's too little, too late. It needs to be owned. From the top down, we need a voice that is saying this is a priority, and we need to be <coughs> focusing on it strategically, structurally, systematically in the mm -hmm. education systems. Um, and then I think we'll start to see what rewards that's going to give us. Uh, and this applies for Belgium, but it applies for Europe, it applies for the whole world. I think that's enough though, right? Thank Am you. I right? <laughs> well, thank you. I think the presentation. <laughs> I think we'll share the, 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 uh, the presentation as well as your contacts uh, with everybody who's present here. Um, yeah. And I think you're available for more questions. Maybe I am, yeah, sure. I'll be here a little while. Uh, I think we're going to, but I know you've got to get back to your busy day. Thank you so much for all being here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.